of late I've been getting a ton of questions in regards to gearing. Dave, what should I run on my R6 track bike? What should I run on my 1000 street bike? Whose gearing kits are the best? What do you recommend? So let's just stay with street bikes for now and deal with that specific discussion because track bikes and gearing for track bikes are extremely specific to that track. And so that's a very convoluted question and it also depends on everything to do with your pace, your engine size, etc, etc. So let's just stay with street bikes because ultimately very few of us take race bikes to the track in terms of whole numbers. So gearing, let's start with the big bikes, let's start with the thousands. 100 mile an hour in first gear, that's a lot of speed. Does it make it usable on the street? Not really. I know with my own 9R1, it judders a little. Trying to get it going, I've got to fan the clutch to make it work and drive it off away. That's a little tedious. So how could I improve the rideability of the bike? Well, changing the gearing. Now, a lot of questions in regards to gearing want specific numbers. So what I would suggest is this. Whenever you change gearing, especially with the bike that you have, you've got to look at the way you use it. If you commute, you want economy. Leave the gearing alone or change the gearing so that your RPM drops if you're sitting a lot on the freeway. And of course, you have to make sure for your engine size that the engine can pull that gearing. Now with the big bikes to stay on track because they're so fast in first gear, a lot of people will go one down in the front and two up in the rear. And when they do that, that changes the position of the rear axle. That therefore changes the handling of the bike. So don't just assume because you put gearing on, it's all gonna be honky-dory, it's not. You need to make sure when you change gearing that the rear axle stays in the stock position you have it in now. In order to make that gearing change, then you need to cut the chain to the right length. So. You can count the number of links in your chain or you can just buy a 120 link chain and cut it to size. Either way, the point here with a thousand is that a hundred and first for street use is pretty ludicrous. So <laughs> a lot of people will change the counter shaft gearing and bring it down one and go up two. Now the knock on effect of that is of course your speedometer is completely knocked out of whack. So you have to get something like a speedo healer in order to make sure that you are not doing ridiculous amounts of miles over a short distance because the speedo is all jacked up. So whenever you change gearing, which is, this is the second point, you have to make sure that you put something like a speedo healer in place so that you don't rack up thousands of miles when actually you're only doing hundreds. So. That deals with the thousands, the 750s and 600s. Well, a 750's got a little more torque. It's a little more rideable, maybe dropping one in the front will lengthen your wheelbase a little. You might have to change your geometry in the rear a little bit. But because that motor is so great for the street overall, there's not that much reason to change the gearing on the bike. Personally, you may disagree, and that's fine too. 600s, uh, especially if you buy the modern versions, which are much more peakier, down low are very hard to ride on the street. They're not that user friendly until you get them up around eight to 10,000 RPM. So changing the gearing for that to make it more rideable, yeah, that makes a little sense. It makes it easy, definitely easier to ride on the street instead of having to fan the clutch to get it to go or keep the revs way, way high to get it in the zone where it will accelerate quickly on the throttle. Again, the same rules apply. If you want to change your gearing, you have to look at geometry. You have to make sure the axle stays where it is, get the right chain, etc., etc., and go through all of that. If you're running a smaller bike, say a Ninja 250, then you may want to run different gearing for a different reason in that you don't want the bike sitting at eight or 10,000 RPM on the freeway for 40 minutes to an hour. You want to bring those RPMs down so that you get better fuel economy and your engine is getting less beaten up with those high RPMs. So looking at gearing for the street, you need to look at the application. You need to look at the reason why you want to change the gearing and then you want to make those decisions. 
but your rear axle position is critical especially if you're on a 600 and above and you want good riding performance in the twisties because your swing arm angle has to be right now let's get on to the fun the side of this in terms of what to use do I recommend any specific kits? Well, I've always used Driven because they pre-cut the chain, everything's figured out. Those guys have done a lot of research and I really like their kits. And their customer support is awesome. So that's who I've used now for three years and they have a great product. What do you use? Well, it's up to you. Chains come in many versions. You can come as a cheap roller chain that needs to be lubed, cleaned and adjusted weekly. It can come as an O-ring chain which should be lubed, cleaned and adjusted. Yes, it needs to be lubed. It's an O-ring chain. It still needs chain lube. Um, every three to five hundred miles. And then there are obviously much more heavy duty chains which are far more, far more substantial in terms of the build quality and the longevity of the chain which need the same level of maintenance so let's dispense with that myth it's an o-ring chain it doesn't need lubing yes it does it does need cleaning the best time to lube a chain when it's hot metals fully expanded it's much much better for you to lube the chain in that instance so let's get back on track now aluminum sprockets versus steel sprockets on my street on my R1 that I teach on I keep all the OEM stuff on the 530 chain and the steel sprockets I don't want to be going through chain and gearing all the time I want to get 20,000 miles out of what I have if I can on the other hand if you're on a track bike you might want a 520 conversion which is a lighter chain much lighter sprockets which means the bike will accelerate faster therefore give you the chance for reduced lap times based on those factors that's an investment again you've got to figure out what gearing works that's the important part so you need to start going to the local track and talking to the guys that run your kind of bike and lap times that are reasonably close to yours as to what gearing they use use that as a baseline if you think you're going to get a lot faster then put gearing on the bike that will over time allow you to get faster if you're going a certain pace and you're quite comfortable being a B or a C rider and enjoying a track day figure the gearing out keep it at that that will work for you at all times but look at the reason why you're buying the gearing and making the gearing change and make the appropriate decision versus OEM chain and steel sprockets or something like a driven kit where it's pre-cut and pre-made and you can select the gearing. Obviously, maintenance is critical. And if, for example, you don't loop and adjust the chain, then you're going to find the chain is, has kinks in it. And those won't come out, so you need to replace the chain. The other thing also is that with aluminum sprockets, in terms of maintenance, your rear wheel needs to be 100% aligned accurately. No ifs, ands, and buts. If you're not sure, when you change your wheel, look at the teeth. If they're shaved off in one direction or one angle, then that tells you your rear wheel isn't straight. <clears throat> Take the time to align it perfectly accurately. There are multiple tools out there to do that and make it right. So get it right because it's a very expensive proposition to be changing sprockets every few hundred miles because your rear wheel is completely out of whack. Lastly, links on chains. Master link, there are two kinds. There's a clip link and there is a peen over rivet type link. The clip link, if you're just commuting and running backwards and forwards and you put the clip link on, clean it and put silicone all over it, then yeah, I'm okay with that. You're not stressing the chain heavily. You're not going ballistic nuts with it. You're using the chain appropriately. And a clip link is much easier. It doesn't require any special tools. You just put it together. But you have to make sure the clip faces the right way. A rivet, <coughs> excuse me, a rivet type master link is much more permanent. So if you've got something wrong and you cut the chain too short, you're screwed. You have to take the rivet off, go get another rivet, go get another chain, whatever. So a rivet master link is really for track and race use. 
if you feel you want that for the street, it's just one less thing to worry about, I'm right there with you. I don't use clip links personally on my chains anymore. I did for probably 30 years, but now because of the rivet stuff, it's just much easier to do that. It's one less thing to worry about. So thanks for all those questions in regard to gearing. Hopefully that's food for thought to let you sit back and mull over or perhaps discuss with your friends changes to your bikes, but more importantly, give you some good data to base your decisions on based on the use and the reasons why you will make that gearing change. If you have questions, please send them to me via Facebook at Dave Moss Tuning or alternatively leave them here at Catalyst, Re Catalyst Reaction SBW at YouTube. Thanks a lot.